Okay, so here's the CSS demonstration that I want to go over. In Moodle, if you scroll down to week three, you can see that down at the bottom of this, underneath of all of this stuff, I've got a file called CSS Demonstration. If you download that, it's just a simple zip file with some HTML uh, and some images in it. And I've already got it uh, downloaded to my desktop and I've extracted the files out. And there's a before.html and a couple of pictures in it. And this page is actually a really simplified thing I stole off of Wikipedia, just the Back to the Future web page. So we're going to style this with some CSS. So this is the page that I'm going to go in and refresh as, as we work on this. So the first thing I've got to do is uh, I've got it open in uh, Notepad. I've got my HTML file. But the cool thing with CSS is that you don't really change the HTML file once it's, it's done. Once you've got the, the words and the pictures in it, your HTML file is kind of complete. You don't really need to touch it that much anymore. The only thing that you really need to do is add in the link tag to the style sheet. And I'm trying to bring up my code real quick on another computer. And the way the link tag works is you give it an href. I kind of wish this was SRC, like image tags, so everything was nice and unified, but it's not. Um, I haven't created this yet, but I'm going to create a file called styles.css. And it's supposed to be rel equals stylesheet type equals text slash CSS. The rel and the type are kind of weird. A long time ago, they thought there was going to be lots of different types of things like CSS, and it ended up we only, we just picked CSS and we didn't come up with anything else. So they thought there were going to be all kinds of other weird options for this. Uh, this is the only one that, that made it through. So now my, my page, I, this CSS file doesn't exist, so I have to create it. So in Notepad, I'm going to create a new document, and I will immediately save it as styles.css in the same folder where my HTML file is. This is actually pretty darn important. Whenever you create a CSS file, it should be in the exact same folder as your HTML um, in order for it to work properly. If you remember, CSS files don't have tons and tons of doc type and head and body tags that you have to worry about. They only have one line, and it's actually not even that necessary. You can get by without it. I wouldn't recommend it. It's just kind of a, a good practice to have this. Um, but at char set UTF-8, you're just telling the computer which alphabet it's supposed to use for this. So the way that I typically recommend that you start with a CSS file is to select all of the HTML elements that you have on a web page that you want to be able to add style to. The very first one should almost always be the body tag. Whatever design styles we apply to the body tag will be applied to the entire document. You can kind of think of this as setting the defaults for your web page. So for example, I could do color, color, green. The color property actually refers to the text color. And if I go back to my Back to the Future page and I refresh it, I don't know if you saw that, but everything suddenly shifted to green. Didn't matter where the text was on the page, all of it is now green. That's horrible. I don't actually want to do that. Um, but what I'd like to do is um, some very basic stuff. I'd like to put a background image on this. And I actually have one ready to go inside my Images folder. I'm going to drop in this logo.jpg. And the way that you do that is going to be background dash image with a colon and then after that you've got to put URL and parentheses and what you put in the parentheses is the path to that file uh, this is again this is almost like the link and an image source um, property it's just written slightly different there's not too many other ways of, of doing this images slash logo dot jpeg um, there's no real difference between JPEG and JPG. They're identical files. They just came up with one that was four letters instead of three. Um, so now what this will look like is, aha, I've got a nice repeating background. And now I can't read anything on my page. 
Um, but it's pretty simple. It repeats. I can tell it not to repeat. I can say background dash repeat and set that to no repeat. And that only puts one of them up. Okay, that's not bad. Um, you can also change where the image goes on the page. It doesn't have to be in the upper left corner. And this is background dash position. And you can say, oh, I can never remember which one's supposed to go with which. Center, center. We'll put it horizontally center and vertically centered. Make sure I save that. Of the entire page. What's that? You couldn't do it three times, but you can do... Repeat X. I'm going to just put these across the... I think I have that right. You can have it repeat across the top uh, in a certain direction. This is a horizontal repeat, and if I put uh, repeat Y, the Y axis, it will repeat down down the side. Um, it doesn't have to be the, 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 right si the left side. It can be the right side. Unfortunately, you don't get, you can't repeat it a certain number of times. If you, were, if you needed to do that, what I would probably recommend is bring the image into Photoshop and make an image that's three of them stacked on top of each other or beside each other and make that your, your image that you needed. Yes, if, if you just set the background repeat to just plain old repeat, it's the whole page. But, of course, now we've got a problem where I can't read anything. In order to fix that, i probably at least do this, color white. You may also see colors written like this. That uh, I'm going to show you hexadecimal color in a, f in a few weeks. Uh, there actually is a math behind this color coding system, and it allows you to create 16 million different colors. Um, but there are about 180 or so that you can just call by name in CSS. So I'm going to leave that as the hex code for now. But that will change all the fonts to white. Now they're a little bit more legible. Well, it won't do all the fonts. Actually, we have to do the links a little bit differently, but I'll show you that in a minute, too. Um, not quite done. I would actually like to do some other stuff to this to make it a little bit, uh, a little bit nicer. We're going to do... background-attachment fixed. And I'm going to set this back to no repeat. And this is supposed to be center, center. So this is going to put it in the middle of the page, and it's going to be fixed. And you'll see what that does in just a second. The background image stays still, and then the text uh, scrolls over top of it. Now, unfortunately, we've got this area. I, I told it not to repeat, so we just put the one image dead center in the page on a white background. Well, that's not that great, because I'd like the background to actually be fully black. You can do that with background-color. And the hex code for that is all zeros. Hex codes are always six or three characters long, and they always start with a pound symbol, six characters. Um, this one or that one? So now, aha, I basically have one image in the middle and a black background behind it. And because this image has a black background, it kind of looks like it's seamless. Uh, like my image is actually taking up the entire background, but it's really not. Just a bunch of color, and then there's an image. Okay. That's a lot of code. I mean, that's a lot, a lot of code. CSS actually has a couple of shorthand ways of, of doing certain things. Um, I can actually combine all of this into one line of code. 
I can just simply say background, and then I have to put color, the URL thing, I'm just going to copy and paste that. No repeat, fixed, center, center. Ugh. Fixed, center, center, color, no repeat. Yeah, I got all of them. If I take all of this off, it shouldn't change a thing. Yes. Refresh that. And they do have to be specified in this order. The computer is looking for specific keywords at certain points. Um, and usually what I do is I have one of these saved, and then whenever I need to, I just refer back to it in whatever order it's supposed to be in, because I never remember it. Um, so you'll see, I think the book is going to take you through the, the longer ways of doing it so that you can learn all of the different commands, but then you'll get uh, these, um, the shorthand ones a little bit later. Okay, some more things that I suggest that you do for your um, design is going to be um, one called line height. I'm going to do something that doesn't look like it makes any sense. A 1.5 them. I'll show you what that does in just a second. So, before I hit refresh, notice how far apart the lines are, like what the spacing is, and, and this is basically single spaced um, paragraphs. As soon as I hit refresh, see how they stretched out? If I set, I, sorry, this did one and a half um, spacing. If I set that to two, I'm going to do double spacing. It is a lot easier to read. I, I think that most browsers actually squish the text so tight and compact that it becomes a little bit harder to read. Um, and I personally prefer all my sites at 1.5. Um, I think that looks a little bit better. Uh, let me change some font properties. I can do font family. And I'll get to that one in just a second. I'll put the properties in there in just a second. I'm going to do font size. Oh, you're probably also wondering what an M is. I should explain that one. That is a uh, the height of a capital letter M of a given font. So when it says 1.5 M's, what it does is it goes through this font and tries to find a capital letter, specifically a capital M. There we go. And it says the line height of whatever this font is should be one and a half times the size of the, basically the biggest capital letter. So if I change the font size of this to 14, 16, 18, 20, whatever, it will automatically multiply the, um, the line height for me. The problem, you could also specify it as 16 pixels. And then my line height is always 16 pixels. However, if I change my font size, I think right now it's 12 pixels might be a little bit too small. There we go. So this is 12 pixels tall and 16 pixels in between. Let me make that something like 24 pixels. They stretch out. And it kind of does the same thing as an M. The problem with pixels is that if I change my font size, it doesn't actually change the distance. The line height doesn't change. If instead I use this M's, Think of it as a multiplier. It changes it based on no matter how big the font is, it's always going to be one and a half as the spacing. Uh, that may be a little bit weird if the takeaway from this is, is just line height should always be in this weird M thing. And think of it as it's going to multiply your font size. Let me do font family now. You have a bunch of fonts that you're allowed to choose from, but not that many. Um, on the web, you're very limited in your font choices, and that's becoming less and less the case as some new technologies have been created. For the stuff that you guys are going to be doing, you're limited to the fonts that the users already have on their computer. The list of common fonts between Mac, Windows, and PCs is about 24 fonts. It's not much. Um, print designers get all the fonts they want. They can go and, and 
install 10,000 fonts on their computer and they can put them all in Photoshop, but web designers were kind of limited. Um, this has, there are some technologies that will let you import fonts from other places, but the default fonts, there's about 24 of them. Most of them you've probably seen before. Um, and Arial Helvetica, comma, sand, serif. So what the computer is going to do, because we can never quite be sure that even that default list of fonts is working properly, there's a possibility that somebody's Arial font file has been corrupted, and they can't display Arial for some odd reason. So what the computer will do is, the first thing that their computer is going to try and do is load Arial. If it cannot find it, it's going to fail over to Helvetica. And if it can't find that one, then it's going to fail over to whatever the computer has uh, set up as its default sans serif font. And sans serif is your block letters. Uh, do you know what a serif font is? If you, let me do this in Word real quick. Change the font real quick. The one on the left is a block letter. That's a sans serif font. The one on the right has the little Batman ears on it. That's a serif font. It's a French word, and it ba I think it means feet. Um, and so whenever you see the little flares, that's a, actually a category of font. Um, and the computer has defaults already set for serif and sans serif fonts. And so if it just if they've gone bonkers on their computer and just thrown out all the default fonts and just chosen their own crazy stuff, we can just say, okay, whatever it is you picked on your computer, just use that. Um, but what this will do to our page, see how the font changed? Definitely a different font now. That's Arial, because this computer does have Arial, so it didn't need to go over to uh, the other one, to Helvetica. So this is what I typically start off with on, on any CSS project. Set the, set the body tag to all the defaults. Pick your font color, pick your major fonts, um, usually the line height and your backgrounds. And that was a pretty long-winded explanation. Usually that takes about 60 seconds to, to put all together. Um, the next setup is uh, the headings that we have on the page. On this particular page, I have headings one and two, h1 and h2 tags. And if you if you happen to have the file open, you can look through the HTML file and see the h1 tags. There's a bunch of paragraphs. There's some image tags. Um, everything that all the headings that come after the h1. There's six or seven h2 tags. So that's really all I have to work with, except for down near the bottom. There's an unordered list of all of the links at the end. And I'll show you how to deal with that in just a second. So with the headings, I can do some stuff to both of them at once. I can select both my H1s and my H2s and change them around however I like. So what I'm actually gonna do is set my font family. Actually, that's not right. I'm gonna show you the shorthand, font. I can set, no, it's just gonna be family. Sorry, never mind. Times New Roman. Oops, I forgot to hit undo. Times New Roman. There we go. I think I spelled that right. Yeah. See how my headings now have are in a different font. Um, actually, here's a nicer font that I've used before. And I'll make Times New Roman my failover font. So this is the Georgia font. If the computer can't find that, it's going to switch over to Times New Roman. Um, and then it'll just pick its basic serif. Times New Roman, since it's so big that the title is three words, the computers get a little confused by that. Uh, CSS thinks that every time that there's a space, it's supposed to load something new. So what the computer would actually try and do this it, without these little um, 
single quotes, is it would try to load a font called Just Times. And then it would try to find one called New. And then it would try to find another one called Roman. Uh, and it won't be able to do that. If you have to have spaces in the name of a file, usually what you do is you put single quotes around it, and the computer knows that that's all one thing now. So what I just did was I grabbed all of my headings on the page and gave them a different font. Then what I can do is grab each of those headings individually and set their own font size property. So I can make my headings 30 pixels big, or my heading 1s, and my font size for the heading 2s, I can make those 20 pixels. So this sets up sort of the default of all of my headings, because it's got a little comma list, and then I can go into each one and specify something a little bit more for them. This should blow them up pretty big. There we go. Yeah, it was suddenly a lot bigger. Um, you may also see that this is going to be really hard to read. I have the resolution on this monitor set to 1024 by 768. It's really, really low. Your monitors, or a lot of monitors nowadays, are widescreen. They're up to a, close to 2,000 pixels wide. It is almost impossible to read text across an entire computer monitor. Um, your eye actually gets lost when it tries to go back and find the beginning of a new line. Typically 10 to 12 words is about how wide you want to make any website. In order to do this we need to be able to put a width on the HTML. And they made you do this in some of the uh, uh, chapter exercises but it probably didn't make too much sense. What I'm going to do is put a div tag that's nested on everything inside the body. I'm coming right inside the body tag, starting a div, going down, and right before the closing body tag, I'm going to finish it off. What I'm allowed to do now is I can write a style, a CSS style, for that particular div tag. And I can say width equals 960 pixels. Oops, not this one, this one. And I actually have this blown up so big that you can't see it. I've shrunk it down way too much. Um, but you can see that it doesn't stretch across the entire page anymore. It's actually, the entire thing is only 960 pixels wide. I can shrink that down even further. Let's make that like 600 pixels wide. I'm actually getting kind of annoyed by the, that background image. I think it should be, should darken it out or something so that it's not quite so, because it's really hard to read across the yellow. I'll do that in a, in a minute. Um, now this, of course, just aligns it. It's all over on the left-hand side. So you can think of that div as creating a nice little box, sorry, uh, that lets you contain your site. If you would like to, you can set your box to be um, in the center of the page. Now I think almost everything that I've done so far makes sense. You can look at this code and kind of figure out what it is it's trying to do to the things it's, it's applied to. This one makes no sense. This one is a programmer created how to center things on the page and it just you just kind of have to go with it. Um, there's this thing called margin and you set it to zero, that's an O, zero auto. And you're probably thinking, what, what the heck does that even mean? Um, what it does, oops, come back. The margin, as defined by a computer, is this area. To the left and to the right of the 600 pixel uh, design. And what, it, this first number means the top and bottom margin. So it just sets that to zero, so it sort of sits at the top of the page. The auto tells, tells it what to do with the left and the right margin. Now normally, without this, it would just go over to the left-hand side. What this does is it takes the extra space that's left over on the left... on. Sorry. It takes this leftover space, and auto splits it down the middle 
puts half of it on the left and half of it on the right. And you're probably thinking, why the heck would they do that? That makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense uh, to designers. To a programmer, that's perfectly logical. <laughs> and you'll see a lot of weird little quirks in CSS, because CSS was designed by programmers, not necessarily designers. That one's a little weird, but that's also one of the weirdest things in CSS. Oh my god, this is almost starting to look like a web page now. I mean, we got stuff to do yet, but yeah. Okay, down at the bottom of this example, I've got a bunch of links, and they're blue on a black background. That's really hard to read. It'd be nicer if they were, well, maybe if they were light gray, so that they weren't white like the rest of the text, but you could tell that they were a link, but because they were slightly different. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you how to specify your link colors. This one's weird. That's not that weird. A um, visited a focus a hover a active. Oh dear God, what is all this? The A tag. You've made a couple of A tags now. That's what you put around text to turn it into a link. So th all five of these are going to go grab all of your link tags. But they're going to grab them only at certain times. Link is when your tag is blue. When it's blue, that means you haven't clicked on it yet. What color do they become once you've clicked on something? I, I heard it. Somebody said it. Purple? You've seen it do that? I can, I can make that happen. If I go to the official Back to the Future website, right, and then I come back, see how kind of it's changed to uh, purple? Good. Yeah, you're not going nuts. And then there's this. Uh, sometimes this, this works. Most of the web browsers do this. When you click and hold on something, it actually turns red. Most people don't ever notice that one. That's the active one. Hover is something that HTML just doesn't do normally, but that's we, we can actually have it change the color or underline when the mouse goes over top of it. And the only one that seems new is focus. And what that's going to do is if someone doesn't have the fine enough motor control to use a mouse, they probably have been using the keyboard to navigate a web page. When you hit tab, I don't know if you can see it. I'll definitely show you when we do the example. You can, when you hit tab, it will select the next uh, link. And when you hit spacebar, or sometimes return, depends on the browser, it goes to that link. So that was the one I had selected. That's a handicap accessibility thing, and that's actually pretty darn important for web pages. So you can make it whatever you want in all of these. So let me just do this. Color found C, 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 C. That's a, a gray color. Let me make that a little bit darker. There we go. That's too dark. There we go. That's a little bit easier to read. So now, these links that have been visited, that I've clicked on, they're still purple. What I typically recommend, I think this ends up working out professionally a little bit better, is make your link and your visited the same color. Unless you think visiting a, a link should, like if you're going through a list of things and you want them to go in order, there's probably not much reason to have the, the visited color at all. Um, it's, it's a design choice that you get to make. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you never do that. Um, but I find that this saves me a little bit of time. Oh, the other thing I can do is text decoration. I can set it to none. That gets rid of the underline. And the nice thing is, I should say for this, typically whatever you put in the link, except for color, it does spill out into the rest of them. It makes them uh, inherit all of this. So the text decoration, that underline is gone. Um, focus, hover, and active, I usually make them all the exact same as well. So I'm going to set the color on this to RGB. I think this is yellow. F F F F zero zero.
There we go. Now, I was also doing the tab thing. Now you can see tab working as I hit tab on the keyboard. You can also, for this, we can specify that the text decoration come back. Set it to underline. This is only going to work for focus. So if I refresh the page and I focus, I don't know if you can even see it really, but there, there is the underline. But it doesn't do that for hover because I didn't specify it in hover. I'll probably tell you to go ahead and do that. There we go. Now everything gets a nice little underline. The active is when you click down on the mouse. Most people don't even know that that exists, that things are supposed to turn red as you're clicking on them. So I usually just ignore it and make it part of the hover and focus. I don't think there's too much important about active. What else do you want to go over? Oh, okay. I also have a bunch of images on this page. And what I'd like to do is have them, right now they're sitting at the beginning of each paragraph. And they just sit there to the left. Like it's a gigantic word that starts the, the um, paragraph. What I'd like to do is have these um, either on the left side or the right side and have the text flow around them. So I'm going to create what's called a class. I think I showed this to you the other day in my CSS. I'm going to call it dot write. Now that's not an HTML command. The way that I'm going to link that to something is I'm going to find my first image, which is right here, and I'm going to add class equals write. That little bit of code right there. You don't put the dot in the HTML. You put the dot in the CSS, and it just reads the rest of it. And it knows now that it's supposed to go into the HTML find a class called write, and it's going to apply whatever's in here. Here's the command that'll throw this over onto the right. It's called float. You can simply set it to write. It's kind of like a line, like you're used to in Word. Um, I forgot. But at this point, I did do something wrong. I forgot to save this page. So now that I've actually made a change to my HTML, I've got to save that. Everything I've done up until now uh, has almost exclusively been in the styles. So now, haha, -ha, okay, it's over on the right hand side. Oh, and the only weird thing that can happen when you uh, push things over here is sometimes the text will butt right up against the edge of this image. You can actually push stuff away. And that is done with something you've seen with that margin. But I can actually specify that I just want the left margin to be 20 pixels. And that's going to push it, all the text will run away from it a little bit. I can do the same thing and create a dot left. And it's just going to be sort of the reverse of this. I have to change the margin. And what I can do now is find my next image tag. And I can say class equals left. There we go. So you can see the text runs away from floated things. And I think there's one more image down here. I can choose left or right. And I'll make it right. But the nice thing about classes is you can use as many of them as you want on the page. You can, we can pick up, if you add 10 more images to this, you can make them alternate back and forth. Click left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, however you'd like to do that. There we go. He's over on the right. The only other thing that's really kind of bugging me about this site is that the Back to the Future logo is so incredibly bright that it's, it's actually annoyingly bright. Um, what I would actually recommend is the best way to handle this is I'm going to go into my images folder. There it is. And I'm going to open this guy with Photoshop, which is not listed there. Oh, I do have it open. And next week I'm going to give you the big introduction to Photoshop. 
but I can show you some of the really easy stuff. I mean, this is the stuff you can do with Microsoft Paint. Um, under the image menu, there are things like brightness contrast. Um, you can change the, the rainbow spectrum of things uh, in here, but I'm just going to play with brightness and contrast and set the brightness down really, really low. I'm going to use the legacy version. And just try to fade it out so that when the text goes on top of it, there we go. That image is now nice and faded out. The text is actually legible on top of it now. What questions do you guys have about what you just saw? Seem pretty simple? There's a few little quirks to it. You'll get used to things like auto margins. Anything? Okay, I will put this code, this new code up on, um, uh, what is it called, Moodle for you, and this video will be up uh, later this afternoon.